For those that don't know me, I do recognize some of you, but for many I have probably haven't met before. A um, little bit maybe about where a lot of these opinions that I'll share with you come from. Um, probably like a lot of you, I started as an engineer. Um, I had my first 10 years, actually, my career was at HP Labs, when HP was uh, a big company back then. They were kind of known as the Google of the day. It was, it was just a great place to learn to be a, a real engineer, and I loved it. I was working the entire 10 years on software tools for other developers, so it's kind of in that bubble. I still love that space. It's still one of my favorite industries, developer software. It's kind of a, you guys basically, uh, do a lot of that too, but you know, it's a unique kind of customer, but it's a really fun one. Because I had done a bunch of products for developers, and of course this is for those, this is, this is before the internet, right? Because Netscape was the original internet company, so um, this is in the era of client server computing and desktop computing, we were PC industry. And because I had done all these products for developers, when Netscape was getting started, um, I was recruited, so, so one of the earliest developers actually came from our group at uh, HP Labs. And um, I got, uh, I, I was able to join this amazing startup. I worked for Mark Andreessen, you probably know, he's the co-founder of uh, Netscape. And Mark had this vision of um, the future. Microsoft was really the thought leader before Netscape. But his view was that um, unlike the Microsoft era, his view was the internet technologies would not come from one place, it would come from many. And that really Netscape was kind of the natural epicenter or the aggregator of these things. There was already a browser team, many of them came from University of Illinois, you probably know the history there. There's also the start of a server team, one of my heroes in product, Ben Horowitz, many of you probably heard his name. If you haven't, uh, his book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, is probably the best book in our industry, in my opinion. So you should definitely read that. And then um, Ben was running one of the server teams, and I was asked to run platform and tools. So the idea, all these different components that would be used to, again, build applications, which for most of my career has been my thing, but now not just desktop applications or client server applications, but now we're talking uh, in the era of client server. It literally, if you had 100 simultaneous users, that was considered massive. And, to, and of course, all of a sudden, we had millions, tens of millions very quickly. And now, of course, um, Google talks about planet scale, multi-billion user applications. So I was very interested in that. And um, so we had H, uh, the guys that did JavaScript, Brendan Eich, uh was on the team. Uh, SSL guys were on the team. We worked with the startups like Macromedia. It was just a fantastic place to be because every, literally every week, new components were coming. And the other thing that was great is customers. We didn't even have to leave our offices. We had created a customer center. They came into us startups and big companies alike, and I was just having a ball. I would literally still be there, uh, but as many of you know, we lost the browser wars uh, to Microsoft, and so we were acquired by AOL, which is not such a great ending if you're <laughs> there. Um, but I, lucky for me, uh, as part of the Netscape platform work, I had, by f I think, the most fun part of Netscape, which was the developer program. So I got to work with these developers from all over the industry, um, really great ones. One of my favorites became Macromedia, which went and now half of Adobe. But uh, another one was Pierre Omajar, the co-founder of eBay. I just loved his vision uh, for uh, commerce and uh, really marketplaces. That was one of the original marketplaces. It was actually one of the original internet applications. Um, and I was hooked. I just thought he was a very uh, compelling and visionary founder. And uh, I thought he was a genuine guy. And I, I loved, joined to, um, to build the product and user experience design organization. They just had engineers when I joined. Um, and it was another great experience, although I will say that was the one time in my career I wasn't actually uh, my customers weren't developers. My customers were eBay buyers and sellers. Uh, and that was really a 
bigger difference than I expected, for sure. It's a different kind of community. I had a lot of fun, and I did get addicted to marketplaces. But anyway, afterwards, uh, I was pretty exhausted after three very rapidly growing companies, and I um, uh, decided to start with a few friends, a Silicon Valley product group. And we're just literally four people. And we've all sort of been around the block. And we mostly what I do, and this gets to the heart of the talk, is I, I invest in advised startups uh, and growth stage companies today, too. It's not just early stage startups. But um, that's kind of what I love to do. If the, if the founders have a vision that I think is you know, worth pursuing and they want some help on that, that's where I spend my time. But I, I will say, early on, I started doing this like 17 years ago now, it's amazing, but uh, early on I found there are, a lot of, there are a lot of really great founders out there with terrific product ideas, but most of them have no idea how to turn that into an actual product that you can sell. You guys know that, you, <laughs> you create a business around it. It's, you, they need a lot of help. And I found myself, um, even though what I really choose to do is go deep with, uh, come with founders on their vision, I found myself repeating a lot of like, look, you have to be able to execute or none of this is gonna matter. You have to learn sort of the nuts and bolts of doing product. And so I found myself increasingly spending time with these teams, showing them not just you know, helping them maybe with what their vision or strategy is, but on like, how do you actually work as a modern product organization? And um, that's what I'm gonna talk mostly about today. Um, it's a little bit sort of a process wonky talk. Um, process is, uh, you know, in truth, I argue all the time, it's really about culture. It's really about techniques. It's really about the right people. But how, the, how your people work together to solve hard problems is really what this is about. So I, the other th disclaimer I want to say is I don't... Um, in fact, we're really careful at SVPG. We are not the people behind any of the techniques out there. We try very hard to be technique and process agnostic. Uh, because to me, there's way too much religion in all this stuff. And really good product people, good product people know when to use each technique, what it's good for, what it's not good for. And that's one of the most important things. Uh, you, you guys probably know that there is a backlash going on right now against both Lean Startup and Agile. It's been going on for a couple of years. And it's so predictable, I find it boring. It happens all the time with no matter what the technique is. Uh, today, the latest backlash is against design thinking, if you follow, you know. The thing is, these are all these are good techniques and good concepts, but any one of them, you know, the way the industry works, all the pundits get in and they try to oversell everything. You, we've all seen it, agile for, <laughs> agile for the finance organization. And you know, remember Six Sigma, which was actually really good for what it was for, manufacturing, killed so many tech companies because it was used totally inappropriately. Uh, I see that all the time. Agile and Lean, same thing. Design thinking, same thing. The problem with design thinking is people are using it for things that it's really not suited for. But if you use it for what it's good for, it's awesome. So I want to try to bring a level of uh, sort of rationality to this. Um, Let's talk about Lean and Agile and try to separate. Now, I do want to, um, there is one big caveat on this discussion, and that is there is a process out there that I'm actually hoping nobody in this room uses. I, I'd be surprised if you did. It's used by big IT organizations like banks and insurance companies. Uh, if you've heard of SAFE, anybody heard of SAFE? Stands for, I'm glad that most of you have not heard. Uh, it stands for Scaled Agile Framework. And let me just say, it's nothing to do with Agile. It's all marketing, but it's nothing to do with that. So I'm not referring to that. We can talk about it if you want, but I don't know a single tech product company that uses it. So that's not what I mean when I talk about the state of Agile. Um, these core principles, I would argue, are solid. 
Uh, I, n I don't want to see, uh, I never want to work with teams that are going back from these principles. These were forward progress. First two, of course, are the core tenets behind Agile. You know, look, stop doing big bang releases. Don't take three months before you ship something out. No less than every two weeks. And that's nothing to write home about. You all know it, continuous delivery, we're actually releasing many times a day. But the bare minimum is no less than every two weeks. And there are solid reasons for that. A little bit of math and a whiteboard, and I can have it all spelled out. I've never met anybody I can't convince about why that is an important thing to do. But that's real. That actually is where most teams get the benefits of Agile, is just changing the way they work, the way they build, test, release to the point where they are shipping consistently no less than every two weeks. It's not rocket science. It's mostly automated testing, but it's not rocket science. Uh, now, the second one, which is where teams, I think, get the biggest value, but I will also say most companies don't do this, um, and that is to actually empower your teams. Uh, that's another talk. That's the one I think we, we did at that uh, other conference. I have written about this, and I'm happy to, uh, to uh, send anybody the articles or the YouTube links, but it's not enough teams are actually empowered, and if you don't empower a team, it's honestly, you can't hold them accountable. So that kind of one goes with the other. But that's kind of the, the, the real principles, the, the heart of the manifesto for Agile is about that. And so anyway, this is, these are two solid principles about Agile. And of course for Lean, we do need to learn fast in order to in, in, innovate. There is a direct correlation between the number of at-bats we get and our chance of success. If you're working in uh, a lot, so many companies tell me they're doing lean and I, and I asked them to show me on a whiteboard what they're doing and they show me this, they said, well, we're working on an MVP like everybody, right? We're working on MVP. Before I even get into what is that in their mind, uh, I'm like, well, so how long have you been working on that? Four months. And I'm like, okay, four months is not an MVP. Four days is an MVP. So I know they're doing something very different, but what we need to go fast if we're gonna have a chance to innovate. We'll, we'll talk more about that. And of course, waste is bad. Building QA, del delivering something that our customers can't use or don't wanna use or won't buy is not helping anybody. So, and that's the other core principle behind Lean. Those are solid. And I would absolutely hate to see a, a, a company not pursue those. But as you know, a lot of people do get frustrated with Lean and Agile. And I, I spend a lot of time with teams trying to help them get a lot out of Lean and Agile techniques. And I would argue this is kind of the core of the problem. Now I wanna, many of you have probably seen this, uh, Henrik Nieberg is, in, in fairness, he's like my favorite Agile coach. If you know him, he's he kind of, his main client, Spotify, so he did a lot of good work helping Spotify. But um, anyway, he shared this, and for those that don't know what this is, he's saying, don't do, this is Big Bang release, right? This is doing four, you can call those sprints at two weeks, eat two months to get something out only to find out it's maybe the wrong thing. Instead, do this. You, and, and of course, this is just a metaphor. It's his metaphor. It's not a perfect one. But you know, let's start with a skateboard. And his point is each iteration is something we can test. If this skateboard will do the job, we're done. Let's declare victory. If it won't, OK, maybe a scooter, maybe a bike. You know. You need to give a little degree of freedom here but on the metaphor, but you get the idea. This is much better. And I would argue if you're an IT dev shop, this is as good as I could suggest to you. And what I mean by IT dev shop kind of thing is if you don't have product managers, product, real product people, if you don't have real designers, if all you have are developers and some business owner type, I don't know what else to tell you. That's about as good as you're gonna get. You better expect lots of waste. 
You better expect nothing's going to happen fast, but it's better than the old way of doing PRDs. I haven't even heard that acronym in a long time. But it's, um, yeah, it's better than that old world. But this is the root. This is unfortunately what most companies do. This is what they think Agile and Lean really means. In a product organization, this is weak. And the heart of why it's weak is what I wanted to talk about here. The problem is we're really trying to do two very different things. The emphasis, Henrik likes to emphasize, this is all about building to learn. If you've ever, whenever I, when I remember the first time I saw this too, um, I immediately thought of that old analogy, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's what this is. If all you have to work with are a few developers, this is what you do. You use those developers to create something, see how close it is to what you might need, and then improve it from there. Of course, in a modern product organization, we have to do better. We can't afford that lost. I mean, there's the cost, obviously, of going so slow, but the, the bigger issue for most tech companies is opportunity cost. You can't take nine months to figure out something. You need to get to the market much quicker. So the problem, I would argue, at its core is we've got two very different objectives here. The first one is we need to discover a solution, a solution that works. Now, what that really means, and I'll flesh this out in a minute, what that really means is that it's valuable, meaning our customers will buy it or choose to use it. Sometimes they don't pay for it, and sometimes they've already bought your product. It's just a new feature or something. It's usable. They can figure out how to use it. It's feasible. It's actually a little harder than it sounds. It's not just can we build it, but do we have the staff? Do we have the technology stack? Do we have the money to provision this thing? And of course, do we have the time? That's all feasible. And the fourth one is, is it viable for our business. What that really refers to is, well, can we afford this as a business? Can we make money off of this? Can we monetize it? Can our salespeople actually sell it? Can we do cost-effective marketing programs for it? How about, is it legal? Literally, I'm not joking there. Is it legal? Is it something that we can do? How about, does it conform, if you're in Europe, does it conform to things like GDPR? privacy issues, these are all, just ask Uber, just ask Airbnb, viable is hard. You, you, they kind of got away for a while, both of them going under the radar, but now they're not under the radar, and now they're dealing with major viability challenges. All right, so on one dimension, we're trying to figure out a solution that works, but another dimension is we are trying to deliver a solution that our customers can depend on. And that's really, it means that it's something that's solid, it, it's reliable, it works for them. It's something that scales, not infinitely, but scales to the level it needs to scale to. If you're at 100,000 users, if you're at 20,000 customers, or if you're at half a billion users, we need to know that. It's it performant. How well does it run, and is it something we can stand behind. A lot of times the developers will use the phrase release with confidence. They need to be able to push this live and know that they can go to sleep tonight and not stress all night that their customers are going to fall over. So those are two very different purposes. And yet the problem is, if this is how you're working, you're really trying to do both things at the same time. And that, in a nutshell, that's why the concept of MVP, minimum viable product, is such a confused concept for so many companies. They could mean any or all of this. So, well, I'll tell you, most companies, when you talk to the product manager, all they're really looking at is, is it usable and is it feasible? That's all they're looking at. They're not even looking at the hardest ones, which is, is it valuable and is it viable? And the engineers, they're like, it's gonna be terrible, it's not ready for prime time, but it's good enough to push it live. This is not helpful, but that's what's really going on. So what I wanted to talk about is, what are the really good teams? This is sort of my, 
lucky advantage is I've been able to work with a lot of the uh, really good product teams out there. I started doing this early on. Uh, I was introduced to Google when they only had six people, and, um, and Amazon early, and uh, you get to meet a lot of these companies, and when they do things well, I, I sh I'm very interested in those techniques, and I'll spread them around. So it turns out that the best teams out there do work very differently. They don't work the way that sort of Henrik basic IT Agile model works. And that's what I would, I want to talk about. They're already beyond lean and agile. They're getting the benefits, but they're taking significant steps beyond. And there are really, I'll tell you though, one of the tricky things about talking about this is that almost no, but no two companies use the same terms to describe how they work. It's one of those things. There just isn't a, you know, big published framework on stuff like this that you can just cite. Uh, so I always have to ask them, show me how you work, you know, just on a whiteboard or, sh you know, show me the flow, what goes on. It's not hard. It doesn't take long for them to explain. And I will tell you consistently, no matter what they call it, and by the way, I'll share with you what a lot of the most popular great companies call it, but you'll see it's different at each company. But what's important isn't what they call it. What's important is that you will find these three things at all of those companies. And this is what I look for. All right, three big themes. The first theme is all about risk. Many of you probably know Diane Green. She was the co-founder of uh, VMware, which I think is one of the, was one of the best companies. And, um, and she's on the board of Google, and she was for years running Google Cloud. But this is really true. The riskiest thing is to not take risks. And product is all about taking risks. One of the most common problems I actually see in product teams is they're scared to take risks. Uh, they, all they do, there's a term for it, we call it optimization rather than discovery. All they're doing are these little, little tweaks. They're working on the funnel. They've been working on the funnel for the last three years, and all they're doing is trying to go from 3.7% to 3.71%, that kind of thing. They're using Optimizely. They're using test and target, whatever. Uh, and by the way, doing optimization, everybody should be doing that if you have sufficient traffic. Don't get me wrong. But that is not a value creation activity. It's a value capture activity. It's not discovery. Discovery is about creating value. So, and that's, they're often called split tests, this kind of A-B testing, because they're not risky. They're just, yeah, you're changing the call to action a little bit, or you're tweaking something. So do it, yes, but that's not the primary product work. That's like a background task that all product teams are doing all the time. All right, so you've got to take risks. And really, modern product is around these risks. So I alluded to this before. I showed you those four risks, but I want to call them out. The key here is the obligation on the product manager in particular. But this is really the product team, product manager, designer, and engineers. They, are, they need to tackle these risks before we have our engineers write a line of production code. And that's a big change, right? So that's the opposite of Henrik's model where you just have the engineers go write code in order to try these things out. We need to do this before. Now, it's beyond the scope of this talk, but I, I literally do spend a solid two days with teams on the techniques we use to do these. But let me just say now, there's, uh, there are these four risks, value, usability, feasibility, viability. I shared that with you before. We have quantitative techniques and we have qualitative techniques for all four of these risks. We have four different kinds of prototypes. And, and they don't align, unfortunately. That would be too simple to explain. They, they don't align. But there are four different kinds of prototypes that are used for tackling these four different kinds of risks. Every good team I know is competent on all four of those kinds of prototypes. It, product is mostly about prototypes. Sometimes we can actually tackle risks even with less work than a prototype. 
And just to be clear, there are many kinds of prototypes. I mentioned four major kinds. All of them, I wouldn't even consider it a prototype if it's less than an order of magnitude savings as compared to building a product. So this is a tiny fraction of the work to actually build. So this is our first theme. In all the best teams, I find they are doing this. They know that they have to identify the big risks and then tackle them before they have their engineers go build stuff. That's a big one. Now, be clear, not everything we build is risky. Some of the things we build are just considered literally no-brainers. We just put it on the backlog, just go. Make a judgment call. If your engineer, your, at least your senior, most senior engineer, your designer and the product manager say, look, we're not worried about the value, we're not worried about usability, we're not worried about feasibility, and we're not worried about viability. We, this, is some, this is something we've done several times before. Just knock it out. There's no law that says you test everything. That would be incredibly slow. On the other hand, if you're working on something that's tough, your job is to say, look, on this, value is a big risk. Viability is a big risk. We're going to focus there. And then the question becomes, what's the fastest, cheapest way for us to tackle that? And that's where the four kinds of prototypes come in. That's where the qualitative versus quantitative decision comes in. Does that make sense? That's what this is about. So the first theme you find is the teams know to tackle the risks up front. They don't pretend they don't exist. The one thing I will point out, most product teams in not great companies just focus on usability and feasibility. I did mention that. But what I didn't mention is why don't they focus? Because the truth is those are the two easier ones. I mean, something like machine learning isn't easy. But for most of the time, feasibility is not that hard and usability is not that hard. If you have competent engineers and competent designers, those aren't the challenges. But these two are usually where the curveballs come. The irony is <laughs> those are the two risks that most product teams are not even asked to consider. Now, the reason for that is because in most organizations that aren't empowered teams, the team is given a roadmap created by a selection of stakeholders one way or another. The stakeholders are taking responsibility for the things on that roadmap. If a, if a stakeholder says we want you to integrate PayPal, it's not really something subject for debate if PayPal is really important or not. If the, you can sometimes raise it, but most of the time they're like, look, if you don't want to build it, somebody else will build it. So they are the, the, whoever the executive is that decided PayPal was the new thing, they're the ones that are at least implicitly taking responsibility for that that's going to be a valuable thing. And similarly, if, it's, if PayPal is not like legal, or that's a bad example, maybe it's not uh, appropriate for this particular um, scenario, like maybe it's international and PayPal is, uh, there are different ways to use PayPal and maybe this isn't the appropriate one, then they're taking responsibility for that. The thing is, they don't explicitly take responsibility for that. What they say is, we need PayPal. What they mean is, our international conversion rate sucks, and we need help. That's what they mean. So if the team goes and implements PayPal, and it doesn't actually improve the conversion rate, well, first of all, whose fault is that? You get a lot of finger pointing in most organizations. But that is why it really is the responsibility of the product team to make sure that value is there. This is the big learning to me over the last, I mean, I've been doing product now 35 years, tech product exclusively, but I would say of all the things I've learned, that's the biggest, is that most of the time, the things we think are gonna be so appreciated by our customers are not. I mean, if, if anything, what you learn in doing product a while is humility. You learn that your great ideas are not always so great. And uh, in fact, honestly speaking, 
I, I don't know any company that's better than 50% batting average. Uh, if, if companies are really honest, it's usually closer to 10 to 20%. Google Cloud team admitted to, to me at, to 10%. The Microsoft Bing team admitted to Harvard Business Review, 10%. And, the, and these are not dumb teams, right? These are pretty solid teams, but they, realize, they just know that that's the reality. So that's the first theme. The second theme is all about collaboration, and I, I really mean collaboration. I'm not trying to be politically correct here. I, this is the only term I know for what I'm trying to describe. You all know Marissa Mayer. She was the original product manager at Google. She ran most of... Uh, uh, most of Google's money-making parts of the business, and then she gave a shot to uh, Yahoo. That didn't go so well, but, um, but in truth, I don't know if anybody could have helped at that point. But it's true. To innovate, you need to truly collaborate. Now, what I mean by that is in the old sort of world, somebody either an executive or a product manager would define requirements. That's what PRDs were, product requirements documents. And then they'd throw it over the wall, usually into the design studio, to a designer and say, give us a design that implements those requirements. And then now, by now you've got a nice healthy stack of documentation and you throw the whole mess over to the engineers and say, build this. This is usually where sprint planning happens between the two and the engineers are asked to build it. That is the way they were built. That is sequential. Just to be very clear, even if they're using Agile, that is 90% waterfall. That is the heart of waterfall. And so what the reason, I mean, it's not evil just because it's waterfall. The reason that's bad is because innovation almost never happens this way. And that's because today we know it's not just that requirements drive design, which drives implementation. That's part of it, but it is just as true that enabling technology drives experiences, which drives functionality. Just, I mean, you don't have to look further than one of these things. This is like, this is the MO on a, on a mobile device. A new version of iOS comes out, it's got new capabilities, the designers start taking advantage of it with new gestures, the product managers start taking advantage of it with new functionality. It's just as much that way as this way. And the point is, the way we solve problems in great product teams is literally a give and take between product design and engineering. Really, those three core capabilities. And and uh, you know, there, we could talk a lot. A lot of people don't. A lot of companies don't have the right people for this job. A lot of them don't have the right people for this job. And some of them don't even have. You know, some of them just have the old IT developers that just want to be told what to do. So, this is a high bar to get a good product team. It does have a high bar, but that's so essential that you have this mode of working. Um, this is also why it makes such a big difference when those three roles, it may be three people, I mean, it could be product manager, designer, and four engineers, so it's something like that, but when these three roles are sitting right next to each other, which sounds very old school, but the reason that's such a big deal and nobody has actually figured out a good enough collaboration tool is because when they're not sitting together, this doesn't happen. I mean, it's really hard for it to happen. Sitting, it's one of the most low cost and Im great impact things you can do to really give your company, your team, a better chance at innovation is go out of your way to make sure product manager, designer, and the tech lead sit right next to each other. All it really takes is asking the engineers to make room for two more people. It's not that hard but it is really important. All right, so that's the second big theme you see. On great teams, they will solve problems collaboratively. They don't, uh, it's not that sequential flow of the old waterfall process. And the third theme is really talking about a higher bar. In, the, in weak teams, they're just there to implement a roadmap, basically. 
and they're measured, you know, they, they, you've heard the all time to market and costs thing. The thing is, is actually not, if you've been around this business, it's not that hard to ship things on time, it's not that hard to meet budget, it's hard to solve the problems behind them. That's what's hard. And so, in a product team, we're actually asking the teams to sign up for business results. Um, and that is, yeah, product teams exist to solve problems. Problems for our customers, problems for our business, but problems to solve. Uh, in ways that our customers love, and then the hard part actually, but that work for our business. So valuable, usable, feasible, and then viable. I don't want to make that sound easy, that's hard, but the difference is a good product team, they know they are there to solve the problem. A weak product team is there to implement features on a roadmap. Now, many of you have probably heard of OKRs. Uh, OKR is were created as really the alternative to roadmaps. It is meant to be, to force teams, or at least make it a lot easier to do this. A lot of companies, unfortunately, I struggle with this all the time, they bastardize OKRs to the point where they're just a, an exercise that really doesn't solve anything. So, but in the spirit of objectives, OKRs done right, and I'll show you a little more about what that looks like, that is the point. The K KR, key results, are supposed to be business results. The most common mistake you see with OKRs is people substitute in, oh, we're gonna implement PayPal as our key result. That is not a key result, that's an activity, that's a feature. The key result would be something like we're gonna bump conversion rate international 2%. That would be a key result. Okay, so those are the three big themes. Tackle the risks up front, solve problems collaboratively, product design and engineering, and solve problems, don't just implement features. Every good example I know, actually one of my favorite, uh, was just recent, um, there's a new book that came out, which is called, it's kind of a goofy title, Creative Selection. So it's by Ken Kasinda, who was, uh, it's actually, it's a little bit of a tough read because the author was the tech lead on probably one of the most important efforts in, in our industry's history. He was the tech lead on the hardest, riskiest part of the original iPhone, which was the keyboard. So if you remember, I mean, what is this? It's 13 years old, this device, right? I think now, 12 years old, and it's three and a half years for the first iPhone. So put yourself back a while. Um, but this was the first non-keyboard device. Uh, remember the Blackberry had a keyboard. Uh, even the Palm Trio had a little touch screen, but it had a keyboard. So the big gamble, the Steve Jobs' vision was a 100% touch screen device. The biggest risk, which they knew, the biggest risk was this dang keyboard. And just to be clear, they tried that and failed with the Newton. Remember the Newton? The Newton's primary reason for failing based on Apple's own assessment was text entry was terrible. And so going into this, they knew that was gonna be the biggest risk. He was the tech lead on figuring out how to make text entry, which now, I mean, the entire planet does this all day, every day. We enter text on our phones. But this was a new thing and a incredibly hard. Over the course of about 300 pages, he describes the discovery process that that team on the iPhone used to come up with a valuable, usable, feasible, viable solution to one of the hardest problems in our industry's history. I mean, you all know the value of Apple. I would argue that's on the back of the iPhone and that's on the back of text entry. So. Anyway, I read that book, and you know, Apple's an incredibly secretive company. I am still surprised that they published that book uh, because they mostly don't say anything ever about it. And this is a very detailed description. Now, he, he, the way he phrases it is dis basically discovery in the era of Steve Jobs. 
So maybe they feel like enough time is gone. But for whatever reason, it's great insight into how Apple works. But anyway, when I read that book, I was looking for the, and sure enough, there are all three of these things. It was all about tackling these risks and some of the really aggressive and gutsy things they had to do to tackle that risk early. It was absolutely about solving problems collaboratively at Apple, very much between design and engineering, and is very much about results. <laughs> they don't, you know, shipping a device that works that people can't use or don't want to buy is meaningless. So uh, I would argue that's true with all the good teams. Now, let's talk about what this actually looks like. Um, and, and here's where I'm throwing a, uh, an illustration at you, and I'm a little hesitant, because please don't interpret this as a process. It's a conceptual model. That's all it is. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you how other people describe it. Um, what I'm trying to show here is that I can, if, if I'm talking to a good team that are doing those three things we just mentioned, I can usually show it to them this way. They start with an objective, right, as opposed to a roadmap. They start with a problem to solve. Fix international conversion rate. Fix our customer retention issue. Get us some revenue, <laughs> just some real business problem. And then they have, a, they have discovery work where they are trying to figure out a solution that is valuable, usable, feasible, viable. Without that, the rest doesn't matter. As soon as they feel like pieces of that are ready to be productized, that goes on the backlog. And the engineers do delivery work. And of course, the delivery work is focused on reliability, scalability, performance, and maintainability. Those are the big focus for the engineers. I am throwing other, one other thing in there. If d discovery is really the build to learn, that's the idea. But delivery is not build to learn. Delivery is more like build to run a business. And so there's that different constraint. If the engineers choose to build out, I mean, to, I'm still using Henrik's metaphor here, but if they choose to say, I want to build the tires first, maybe the equivalent of that would be, let's build out a set of microservices that we know we need for this, and then we'll build the user experiences. That's a reasonable way for engineers to build a scalable solution. It's a common way to do it. That's okay to do once you know that this is what we're going to build, because we've validated that. Does that make sense? Well, I call this just discovery and delivery. Uh, it goes by lots of different terms. One of my friends, Jeff Patton, in his sort of a, one of the leaders in the Agile community, he calls this dual track Agile, dual track Agile. Um, this is uh, a little more detail. In discovery, we do a lot of prototypes. Just to sort of set your expectations, uh, even though this does tend to freak a few people out, on the order of 10 to 30 iterations per week in discovery, right? Delivery is usually one or two iterations a week, a lot, that order of magnitude. Discovery, though, is 10, 20, 30 iterations per week uh, now, the reason that's doable is these are not products, these are prototypes. Question? What, what scale of team you Oh, uh, good question, and I meant to mention this. This is one product team, or squad, if you prefer. This is one team. Now, all I'm showing is two different activities. So this is one team. It might be a, a typical team, a product manager, a product designer, and anywhere from a minimum of two engineers to a maximum of about eight to 10 engineers. That would be a very large team. And it's not an equal bell curve. It's more like most teams are three or four engineers. All right, so that's what I mean. Now, I'm going to take your question one little step further. That's one team, but product managers and designers spend almost all day every day on discovery work. That's their job, figuring out what to build and, des and designing it. And the engineers spend almost all day on delivery work. That's their day job, is to build production quality scalable software. However, the product managers and designers spend about an hour a day on delivery work, mostly answering the questions that inevitably come up in delivery. 
and the, pro and the engineers spend about half an hour a day on discovery work, mostly helping to make sure the prototypes, they're playing with the prototypes, that by the way, most prototypes are created by the designer, not by the engineers. Few of them are created by the engineers because they're special cases, but most are created by the designers. But the engineers need to play with those prototypes every day in order to do two things. One, see if there's a better way to do this, and the other is assess feasibility. Yeah? Oh, the question was, are prototypes live in production? That's actually a tricky question. I mentioned there's four kinds of prototypes. One of them is, but it's special. Let's say limited production. Usually, honestly, very, very limited production. But what you're getting at is uh, there is one kind of prototype that is intended to create, collect some actual live data. The other prototypes are more for qualitative use. A very, well, I mean, this is, uh, the question was like, how limited, what does this mean? And the reason I'm hedging is because we have B2B, we have platform companies, we have consumers, there's a lot of caveats here. Also, it depends if we're gonna do this for quantitative or qualitative reasons. So, uh, and they're all good, don't get me wrong, but my answer would depend uh, on that. As a general rule of thumb, it would be a small exposure, limited exposure. Most of the time, it's a very limited exposure done in discovery. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and of course, prototypes are awesome, but they're a discovery tool. Products are what we produce in, in, in delivery. But just because you've got something that's product quality doesn't mean it's selling to the point where you've got, you can ramp up your sales force. That's what we mean by product market fit. That's a whole other big topic. What really mean, what do we mean by product market fit? Let me just say that's really the most important concept in the product world, product market fit, because that's what you can build a business on. So, uh, but that is clearly an output of delivery. So at a high conceptual model level, that's what's going on. Now, when uh, this was first explained to me when I was actually an engineer at HP, um, it was explained this way. Build the right product. And by the way, we were trained on the predecessor to the OKR system, which was the MBO system, which had some differences. The OKR system is definitely better, but they were both objective-based, business result-based systems, not feature output-based systems. So we would have an objective and we would build, focus first on building the right product, what is the right product, and then building the product right. So that's, you may recognize those, that phrasing. It's been around for a long time. When I first met Google, they were referring to this this way. Fake it before you make it. That's, uh, that's today they, uh, well, one of the people at Google likes to refer to the fake it as pre-typing, but it's same idea. Um, I love this. This actually comes from Y Combinator, uh, although the company that really embraced this is Airbnb. Uh, and I love this because it really gets people, especially engineers, to take a double take and think about it, which is they want you to build things that don't scale before you build things that do scale. And of course, that sounds a little wild, but that is, um, that is absolutely what we want to do in discovery. The last thing we want to do is build a scalable solution that we end up throwing away, which sadly is what so many people do, which sadly is what Airbnb did uh, originally when they learned their lesson. So that's another really good way to describe this. Design sprints, delivery sprints, you've seen that. There are more, customer development, product development. Um, they're all trying to say the same thing. So it's just a conceptual model. You can draw it lots of different ways. That's not what's important. What is important really are those three themes. Okay. All right, and I wanted just to uh, highlight, because I did mention early on the really good organizations are also doing truly empowered teams. And I just wanted to define that. It isn't the focus of this talk, but in truth, 
this whole talk is predicated on empowered teams, truly empowered teams. So first point of uh, truly empowered teams is that you've staffed the team with competent people. Now, I use the term competent people with character there. So that's actually two big concepts. The competent people, that'll, that is the number one problem I see out there. The most common issue I see is they don't have a product manager that is competent. And I don't mean that as a personal affront or anything. I mean, literally, they do not know how to do their job. They have not done their homework. They are ill-equipped to actually do the role of a product manager. They, if, they can usually be trained, not always, but they can usually be, but if they haven't been, they are not up to the job. Designer, that's, uh, it kind of depends. At a startup, a lot of startups hire a designer, but nobody in the founding team has ever hired designers. So they often are just get people that are totally not competent to be the designer. If it's a place, well, Airbnb, founded by three designers, they hired awesome designers, so no surprise. So if you, if you know who to look for, that's definitely doable. But designers are important, and of course, engineers. The thing about engineers is, is we don't just have one of them on a team. We usually have between two and 10, which means it's OK if we have one or two very senior experienced engineers and three or four right out of school engineers. I actually like that. I think that's healthy. I think it, it propagates. But that doesn't really work in product and design. You have one. So, and then with character. With character is just a nice way of saying no assholes. Because that's really the big problem we have. If you have a jerk on the team, it just breaks trust in that dynamic that we need on a team it is so easy to lose or never create. So much of a great product team is actually the chemistry of the members of the team. And that really is broken when you have these, you know, a jerk on the team. That's a whole other talk. And, and you need, obviously, people that can cover the skills that we need. You know, for some engineers will talk about full stack engineers. You don't always need a full stack engineers for your team. You just need whatever is necessary for the technologies they will be building with. All right. The second key point is that they are assigned problems to solve and the team is able to figure out the best way to solve them. That is literally what we mean by an empowered team. It doesn't mean or it's also referred to as an autonomous team. It doesn't mean that the team can go decide to go build Tinder or something, because that sounds more fun. It just means that they get to figure out the best way to solve the problem. If our problem is international conversion rate, they're the ones that are supposed to be in the best position to figure out the best way to solve that. And then the third and final is the team is actually accountable for the outcome, the results, not, you know, we don't celebrate when we ship a release. A release today is a non-event. You know, we do those. We do them so frequently that it is literally a non-event. What matters is that we hit an outcome. So you can, hopefully it makes sense to you that this is really the prerequisite to working the way I described. It's hard to work the way I described if you don't have an empowered team. So that's why I wanted to cover it here. I might have gone a little over. Sorry about that. But uh, we'll do Q&A, uh, questions, if anybody has questions. I did want to mention, there's my email right there. And there is a book, uh, if you're interested. Talks more about these techniques. But do you want to um, come on up? All right. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you very much, Marty. Um, appreciate that. So we will open it up for questions just shortly, but uh, I collected a few questions from the team back in Toronto at Connected. We've got about 200 connectors there who, uh, who are sorry they can't be here, but they're, they had some questions for you, so I'm bringing those forward and then some questions that came up as I was listening to your talk as well. So um, let's, start with, let's start with people. Um, so um, 
in terms of dual track, that's a, uh, something that we practice at Connected as well in terms of focusing on those two different mindsets and two different forms of work in terms of discovery uh, and delivery. Um, one challenge that, that, we, that we have is throughout the product lifecycle, um, there's a tendency to swarm in either direction. So get super, getting the whole team super um, discovery focused or, the, or super delivery focused. I'm curious your experience in making sure that there's a balance because if you, you know, get too focused on delivery, you end up not having the next right stuff to build. And, and so I'm curious your experience balancing between the two activities. Yeah, which honestly, I, you see a lot, especially when teams are kind of new to it, because uh, there is a natural tendency to think of discovery and delivery as phases. Yeah. You know, it's like we're in, especially if you've got a client, you know, that's like we're in discovery phase and now we're in delivery, when are we moving to delivery phase? And I try to explain, in fact, that, that is another way I like to describe this is continuous discovery, continuous delivery. I think that's yep. actually much more accurate. So it is true that discovery and delivery always ebbs and flows. Everybody's seen that in your career. It always ebbs and flows, but you want to make sure that uh, you don't do either big bang discovery or big bang delivery. So it's a little bit of uh, coaching yep. to, on the teams to make sure that they're not going too far and that as soon as they have confidence, you know, reasonable confidence on a piece, it goes on the backlog, the engineers get to work. So, you know, once in a while, the uh, engineers are like, hey, we're ready to build the next thing. And the product people are like, we're not ready for you. And so they panic, right? That's that's called a, a backlog running dry. They get, they get panicky. And I always tell teams, this is a good thing. Immediately switch to tech debt work. The engineer should switch to tech debt. Let's the product manager and designer get a little ahead of the game then. Awesome, thank you. Um, next question is actually from our research team. Um, they, they, some of them had watched your talks before talking about product design and engineering. Uh, they were curious for your point of view of where dedicated researchers um, fit into the, the discovery and, and delivery processes. Good, I want to be clear and make sure we're talking user researchers. User researchers, yeah. yeah. Okay, so first of all, love user researchers. <laughs> um, normally the product designers are trained as user researchers and in a startup they are doing the user research so yep. it's a subset of user experience design. Uh, however, once a company gets to about four or five product teams, that's usually on the order of like 15, 20 engineers. I usually encourage them to get one or two dedicated user researchers. Now, uh, I want to be careful though, because what I don't want the teams to do is outsource the learning right. to user research. Because that's like the biggest waste, because the user researchers learn all this great stuff, and the team wasn't there to see the good, the bad, the ugly, and they discount it. So I tell user researchers all the time their work is way too important to be ignored. And their job in that model is to make sure that the five product teams are learning every day. And the user researchers are there mostly to help with the qualitative learning. Yep. And another role, it's really the analogous one on the quantitative side is the data analysts. Right. And so similar, I, I'm a big, if you don't have a data analyst, it's on the product manager. Yep. But as you get bigger, you get a lot of leverage out of one or two pro data analysts that can help the teams answer questions with data. Awesome, cool. Um, you mentioned this in your talk, and I, I know you're pretty public about it, not being a huge fan of roadmaps. Um, but a lot of organizations, uh, especially larger and, and ones that have been around a longer time, are still, still might be in that world. Um, I'm curious if you have any um, advice to share for organizations moving from roadmaps and trying to move towards objective-based um, management techniques, whether that's OKRs or something else. Yeah, I, and I, I should, not all roadmaps are the same. There are good kinds of roadmaps and bad kinds of roadmaps. Unfortunately, the bad kind in empirically represent about 98% of them. Uh, and, they're, and just to be clear, they're prioritized lists of features and projects. But the 2% are good. The 2% are what's called outcome-based roadmaps. And that is the, tr the sort of uh, baby step isn't right. It's like 50% of the way there right. to what I'm advocating. And I think for a lot of companies, it's fine. And, and these are called outcome-based roadmaps, and the idea is, and I, I, this might disappoint a few of you, it usually takes an organization on the order of a year to move from conventional roadmaps to outcome-based roadmaps. 
it's just, it's not technically hard, but dragging your executives along is hard. And they, you know, changing their behaviors because they're really addicted to those. It's sort of a big talk about why they're addicted, but fundamentally they want to know that you're working on the most important things and they want to know when key things are going to happen. So we do need to provide those. I think those are two fair things. But the outcome-based roadmaps, the way they work is you just go through the roadmap. Don't touch it for the first year. Don't touch the roadmap and the process you use. Just go through and for every item on the roadmap, annotate that item with the business result you are hoping to achieve and the measure of, sorry, and the measure of that. It's really the same as what an OKR, the objective and the key result, but you're annotating it. And then the point is, henceforth, anytime you have a review meeting or an email that goes out, we finally ship that PayPal integration. We're saying, yes, we shipped it, and we are doing that for conversion rate, and we're tracking it. Unfortunately, it hasn't moved, but we have other ideas, or maybe, fortunately, it did move. We got a 1% bump. We're hoping for more. We will keep you updated. Um, of the four risk areas, the one that I find that companies still neglect a lot is the, the demand validation and the, the value validation. The usability, most, most teams have some, are doing something to validate that. The business case, you know, usually needs to be there in some form. Um, but the value one, the demand one, any, anything to share around, you know, best practices around techniques to, to validate demand and, and that the value is there? Yeah, so value testing, I, I try to tell teams that set your expectations. Most of your time in discovery will be on value. That's the hardest. It's also the most important. Yep. If you don't get that one right, the rest, the rest really don't matter. matter. Yep. So that's where we spend a lot of our time. There are fortunately a lot, a lot of the best techniques are, are value testing techniques. Um, this is getting a little maybe in the weeds, but there's, when we talk about testing value, like will somebody buy it or choose to use it, there's actually several dimensions to that we have to look at. The first dimension is what you said, demand testing. No matter how awesome it is, do they even have this problem? That's demand testing. Now, for a lot of things, you don't even have to spend time on that because you know the demand's there because you know they're buying, the problem is they're buying competitors' products, not your product. So the demand's there, it's just that your solution is not good enough to get them to switch, which leads to the other kind of value, which is called efficacy testing, which is really about how well do you solve that problem? I mentioned Ben Horowitz. He's just such a, he's actually not just a product leader, a thinker, he's a CEO thinker as well. But Ben likes to say, look, the reason product is so hard is because it's not enough that your product is as good as a competitor's product. He argues in order to get somebody to switch from whatever's product to yours, it has to be on the order of 10 times better. Think about that. Now that's not demand validation, that is efficacy. That's like, like Slack was perceived, is perceived by so many companies as being so much better than HipChat that they're just moved to it in record numbers. Right on. Cool. Thank you. Um, friend of yours, uh, Jeff Patton, talks about um, dual track a lot. Um, we're also uh, big, big fans of his. Um, and he, he talks about, obviously, in delivery, we have delivery velocity. That's something that a lot of agile teams are comfortable with, that notion of delivery velocity. Uh, Jeff introduces a concept of, of, of learning velocity and as a means to see how you're doing in terms of the amount of learning that you're doing and making sure, trying to quantify and, and demonstrate that progress is being made in learning. Obviously, it's easy to show if you've built something. Um, on the delivery side. What are some things to look for in terms of ensuring that that learning velocity is there and that things are, are going in the right direction with the discovery activities? Yeah, I, I've had some arguments with Jeff about this and others too. I, I have, I'm very conflicted on this particular metric ah. because learning velocity, and frankly, the same is true with engineering velocity, these are called vanity metrics. Uh, I, I mean, you heard me throw one out there. I've I'm, I'm just been a hypocrite here. I just told you before, good product teams do between 10 and 30 iterations per week per in week. discovery. Yep. That's what he means. Right. He's trying to encourage teams to do 10 to 30 iterations per week in discovery. Here's the thing. We have to be honest with ourselves. 
you, you know, would that be good? I'd argue, yeah, if you do that, it's probably good, but you could be doing 50 iterations per week and still be terrible. I mean, that's the truth, right? Just like you could be, you know, story points that make it hard to normalize, but you could be doing twice as many story points delivered than you've ever done before and still be terrible, right? That's, it's a vanity KPI. Now, where I soften a little bit is for the first weeks of a team moving to this way of working, it's not bad as a transition. Right, got it, cool. Um, last question that I was gonna ask before opening it up um, to the floor. Um, you mentioned a couple times four types of prototypes. Um, I'm curious if you're able to share a little bit more about what those four types of I prototypes can. are. Yeah, I can, but literally that does take me a full day to go through the four kinds of prototypes. I mean, give, a, give us the teaser. The teaser. So um, feasibility prototypes are the oldest kind of prototype. They are done by engineers to figure out if something uh, is, usually they do it for performance or scalability, but they're not yep. sure. Or like machine learning, they've never used this technology, they're gonna try it. Yep. That's a feasibility prototype. That's the most established. User prototypes are the simulations, smoke and mirrors. They are uh, totally fake. They can range from low fidelity to high fidelity. In other words, on one end, they look like an interactive wireframe. On another end, they look like the real thing. And it's very hard to tell it's not. The nice thing about user prototypes is they are really fast and cheap to create and modify. Uh, and they're created by designers. And to be honest, a, Roughly 80% of the prototypes in practice are user prototypes because they're so cheap and so versatile. Yep. But there's 20% of things they don't do. Right. Feasibility prototype is one. Yep. The next kind of prototype is called a live data prototype. That question came up I was when the, we were talking about it, do you ever test a prototype in production? And I said sometimes there is one of the types and that's a live data prototype. That and would be like A-B testing. Segmenting off some users. Yes, but yep. there are two kinds of A-B tests. A-B tests for discovery and A-B tests for delivery. Right. When most people talk A-B testing, they mean for delivery. It's an optimization test. This is the same concept, but with different tools. And so these, uh, and, and because of this, it's much smaller numbers. And we will often, we do not, we I, I always have to be careful, because there's so many caveats here. Most of the time, when you're doing discovery A-B testing, you are not trying to collect statistically significant results. You could, but it'd be too risky, uh, or it would take way too long. So you lower the bar there and just try to collect some evidence. I'm really oversimplifying here, but that's the principle. And then the fourth kind of prototype is really uh, where some of the coolest stuff going on right now is, but it's kind of the most uh, vague too. They're called hybrid prototypes, and they have characteristics of each of the, uh, it's usually characteristics of user and live data prototype Brilliant. connected in interesting ways that are basically crafted to get the specific risks tackled that we were looking at. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks very much. Sure. Cool. Let's open up for, uh, for questions uh, on the floor. And there's a microphone that'll be coming around. Hi, thanks. My name is Justin. Uh, I work for a large payment network, and my product team services a lot of our merchants and clients um, by providing them with products that they then in turn expose to their end clientele. So one of the challenges that my product team faces is that we create user experience that uh, we can try to influence um, but we, at the end of the day, do not dictate. Uh, the end client dictates. Uh, so we struggle a lot with KPI definition and how to measure the efficacy of our product, how to uh, test iteratively, uh, when at the end of the day, we don't control the end user experience and a lot of the data um, to measure product efficacy. So I'm curious if you've encountered that before and yeah. you have any insights. I mentioned I love uh, developer uh, products, and that's one of the, there's really two major examples of what you're describing. My bet is you're one of them. Uh, one is a public API. You provide a public API, think something like uh, uh, Twilio. And then they don't really control the end applications that are built on there, but they provide services to developers that are gonna build products that we all love and use. And then the other is B2B2C. Think something like 
bizarre voice that provides Amazon style ratings and reviews to e-commerce companies. In both of those cases, the company providing the core technology does not get access to the end consumers or the end businesses, depending on what it is, right? They don't get access, but they are providing a core piece of that. And that makes it harder, right? That's what you're pointing out, it's harder. You're like a level removed, especially if you can't get access to the data. However, there's a great technique, and I tell companies that are doing those two kinds of products that this technique is not only a great technique, but as far as I'm concerned, it's a must-do technique. Uh, the technique is a, 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 one of the forms of customer development, and the idea, in nutshell, <laughs> is you wanna get a handful of companies that are, go, are your customers, whether they're developers do, using a public API, development teams, or it's uh, businesses building on yours, that agree to basically have a very tight relationship with you, where you are essentially co-developing with them and getting access to the data in the name of helping them serve their customers. Yeah, uh, if you're interested, um, <laughs> in the book, the longest chapter is describing this technique. It's a compli uh, It's not complicated in concept, but there's a lot of mechanics to it, but it is incredibly powerful. And, and I think that's a great thing to use for most products, but for the kind of products you're describing, I really don't know how to do it without it. I was really struck by something you said early on, which was this notion of different methodologies go through different trend cycles, and lean used to be really hot, now it's not anymore, design thinking used to be hot, now it's not anymore. Um, a bunch of us here in the group used to work at a consultancy where we used a lot of different techniques, qualitative, quantitative, prototyping, blah, blah, blah. But there are also probably a bunch of other techniques and methodologies that we didn't know about, didn't have a practitioner in the company who knew about it who could teach us. And so what I'm wondering is whether, um, as a team, when you're doing what you're doing, you're like in the grind, you may not have the time to step back and think about, hey, are we not doing well because we suck or because we're not using the right tool for this particular problem because we don't either understand the nature of the problem or we just don't know that methodology. So I'm wondering if you have any self-diagnosis or self-awareness questions that teams should ask themselves to realize that we're not using the right tool for the problem that we have or are there certain practices or behaviors that people should engage in to continue to learn about new tools? Oh, awesome question. Uh, so, because I think uh, actually the techniques in discovery evolving much faster than the techniques in delivery, and keeping on top of this is hard. Uh, I write a blog, and most of the time I'm writing about new techniques because of this. Because and I have a general heuristic. If I see it working well in one of the teams I'm working with, then I describe the technique to at least a couple others of the teams I'm working with. And if it works well there too, I'm going, look, it's probably pretty good. So I'll write about it. And that heuristic has worked out pretty well. Lots of teams told me that was really what they needed. So um, I also think that, uh, uh, well, I mean, that's why I wrote a book. It shares all these techniques. But there's one other tool tip I'll give you. There's a set of people called discovery coaches, that that's all they do is they help teams with these techniques. They're kind of like agile, most agile coaches are delivery coaches. Uh, a discovery coach is really a product or, and or design person that is helping and on top of the latest techniques. And uh, I know a bunch of discovery coaches. Jeff Patton is one of the earliest ones I've ever met. And, and that's what they specialize in is those techniques. Yeah, sure. We have time for one more up at the front. Hi, does this also apply if uh, the product or series of products that you're working on includes hardware and software, same methodology? You said hardware and software? Yeah. Okay, great. Yes, um, in fact, I, I sh should have asked at the beginning how many of you might be doing devices. Um, because there is, I mean, there's lots of kinds of products. Developer APIs is a different beast. B2B to C is a different beast. Devices are a different beast. I happen to, I mean, I, my first 10 years was at a hardware company, so I felt like I grew up in that environment. Uh, everything else is easy compared to that. Um, the main principle I try to tell people working on devices, like wearables, like phones, uh, is that everything we talk about in terms of those risks 
are much more important to worry about because, frankly, the cost of screwing up with hardware is way higher than the cost of screwing up with software. And so, you, you know, you have to, when we look at risk, we're looking at consequence. Remember Fitbit and their, you know, you can't screw up like that. And I will say, of all the companies I've ever been in, Apple has more prototypes than anybody because they're fundamentally a device company. And so they have to do that. And yeah, just you have to take discovery more seriously. I uh, have a higher bar for when it's confident to go forward. How connected should the teams be if it includes hardware and software? Should they be decoupled at some point or work yeah, together? Yeah, that's another, and it, this is a super, this is one of the messiest questions with every company beyond startup stage is how do you slice up the teams? It just, it's always hard because there's real, you've heard the two pizza box teams, there's some real solid reasons for an upper bound on a team, but of course, many companies are way too big for that, you're gonna have many more teams, and so how do you slice it up? It is true that most of the device companies I know, actually all of them I know, have hardware, firmware, software, application teams, sort of structured that way, there's some natural reasons for that. Um, of course, you have to, integrate, you have to have holistic view. Uh, Google has had a very, they've been public about this, I can talk about it, but the Android team for years has been focusing on moving more and more from device to firmware to application level because it gives them a lot more latitude to do the kinds of things they want to do and, and we want to do, like release a lot faster. So it's complicated for sure, but the main thing if you're doing devices you got to take this. You got to take take these risks seriously. Awesome. And just to share one piece of uh, experience from uh, Connected's world, um, we do a lot of work alongside new hardware and with uh, hardware companies, uh, and we've had a lot of success uh, experimenting with creating those pizza box, two pizza box size teams with a mix of firmware, software. Um, and like application level, device level, et cetera, and using that in the discovery track. Um, oftentimes there's a bit of a, a gap when it goes to actually going to market. So it looks a little bit different when it's software only, but in terms of creating teams that focused on discovery and early upfront product concepting and prototyping, we've had a lot of success bringing those teams closer together because historically they sat in different buildings, right? Like firmware, application software, et cetera. And so, um, we, yeah, yeah, please. I realized I went this whole hour and I didn't mention one of the most important things and you're really getting to this. Look, the little secret in product is the best single source of innovation is not our executives, not our customers, not the product managers and not the designers. It's the engineers. Uh, and that is the little secret in software, right? The best single source of, in, of innovation is our engineers. And that's because they're working with the technology every single day. So they're in the best position to see what's just now possible. And that's the benefit you're getting when you bring them together like this. If you had totally segregated, you know, hardware people, the chances that that will inform the application level people in any useful way is very low. So it's a good point to end on is yeah. pay attention to your engineers. Pay attention to your engineers. I, I, would, I would second that in a big way. A lot of the, a lot of the innovation and push, pushing the boundaries comes from, comes from them. And so um, putting them at the forefront, involving them in discovery has been... Um, is a critical uh, component to making sure that you're staying ahead of the curve. Awesome. Um, well, that concludes uh, the formal presentation. Um, we've got lots more time tonight to chat uh, informally at the back, so please, um, please stick around and enjoy. Um, thanks very much for coming out tonight. Um, and thank you, Marty.